Protectors of the Sunnah. Sunnah Baba. Protector of the Sunnah. Okay. I'm good? Yes, you can go. Okay, how many lives? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa alayhi wa alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi wa sabihi ajma'in. Ahamadhan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. We are back again with another class on dealing with the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat. Once again, Surah Al-Hujurat, it means uh, like the inner apartments. It's talking about the apartments or the rooms of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It deals with the etiquette as it relates to building a community. It also deals with the etiquette as it relates to how you deal with the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We understand that the Bedouins who are rough people, how uh, this particular uh, surah got its name, that they would go out and one time they went out in the wives, the houses, or the apartments of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi which were close together, and they didn't know which one he was in, so they yelled his name out from behind his house, which was considered disrespectful. And so the, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reveals in the Quran as it relates to how you are supposed to deal with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also just how you should deal with leadership in general. It talked about as far as the type of people that you have to look out for, the types of things that you don't say to people as far as looking down upon them and, um, and, and holding yourself better than they are because Allah tells us that they might be better than you. And so the true person is one who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most, that's the most value in the eyesight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that our color, we know that our uh, social economic status that means nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that a person can have billions of dollars and a person can have one dollar and the person who has one dollar is they have taqwa or they have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're doing everything in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to do then that person would be considered better in the eyesight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so on uh, the last couple of ayats in the Quran um, we're on uh, number 16, Alhamdulillah, we are entering into the end, going and to the end of Surah Al-Hujurah. Uh, it's, it's 18 ayat, inshallah, we're going to be talking about the 16th today. So, a little bit of brief of what we talked about. The 14th ayat went over the true belief in Iman, and we talked about the different um, aspects of Tawheed, about the unity and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have Tawheed, Asma, Wa Sifat, Ulehiya, and Rububiya. Okay? And so therefore, we were able to distinguish that if anybody tried to share those types of things and which is only due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we know to reject it. Nobody can call themselves Al-Rahman. That's only Allah is only Al-Rahman. Nobody can call themselves Ashahid. Nobody can call themselves Abdul uh, uh, Al-Rahman. Or, uh, or El Rahim, like I said before, and all of the, any other attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, that we will be known as Abdul or Abdush or something. We are servants to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who holds these unique attributes and characteristics that can only be given to Allah, right? So we talked about some of the crazy people throughout Islamic history who have claimed themselves to be, to have this, uh, this special relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have these deviant sects and groups. And some of them, we talked about the Ahmadiyya movement, that where they, the leader had claimed that he was Allah and he was Prophet Isa, alayhi salam, and Samala and something dealing with Hinduism and that whole kind of thing. We talked about the nation of Islam and the deviant ideas that makes them a, 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 a makes them kufr and, uh, and some of the other... Um, some of the other groups throughout Islamic history as to why we are on this, this principle of Tawheed 
how we were able to reject some of those things because of the stuff that they were saying goes totally against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Also, the 15th ayat, it dealt with the height of true belief in Allah, and it do not come mere profession of Islam, but to evolve and develop a successful mastery of trials of life. So we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test us. Allah is going to strengthen you up and build you. And there's a beautiful saying that, uh, that the Arabs have, and it says that Allah doesn't take you out to deep waters to drown you, but to purify you. Okay, so we're going to go through trials of life, and it's important for us to remember and to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with us. Okay, so the 16th ayat that we're dealing with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Say, are you announcing to Allah about your belief in that religion when Allah already knows the contents of the heaven and the earth, and Allah knows well all things? Okay, so. This particular ayat was revealed from the Banu Asad. So once again, remember we said that when the, uh, this is also known as the year of delegation. So the Muslims were kicking everybody's butt and a lot of these people started accepting Islam. Some of them were not as sincere as others, right? So they came, they accepted Islam and this was known as the year, year of delegation. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means in this particular verse is that he's reprimanding Banu Asad. Because Banu Asad, what they did, they had the audacity to claim this uh, tremendous amount of Iman and belief that other Arab tribes didn't have. Now they just becoming Muslim, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they actually declared Islam. Some of them were sincere, some of them were not sincere. But what was going on with Banu Asad is that they had a drought in their area. And they came to Medina specifically so they can get help from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And by becoming Muslim, they figured that they would be able to get more of a benefit by becoming Muslim. And then they even made this crazy claim that we are like true believers in Allah, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then we'll go in, inshallah, we'll go in detail as to how true belief comes over in stages. Right. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he challenges them that I know everything that's in the heaven and the earth. You can't trick Allah. I, you, Allah already knows why the majority of you, the, the main reason that's why you came to Medina is because you were suffering. Right. So they become, they come to Medina, they accept Islam, and some of them were sincere and a lot of them were not. And, you know, alhamdulillah, throughout time, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they increased the iman, but to camp, they came yet walking through the door by trying to say that, listen, we didn't fight against you, right? And we we and we became Muslim. We were the Arab tribes that became Muslim, and so they figured that they deserve some form of special treatment as a result of that particular situation, right? So, true belief comes in stages over a period of time as a result of a battery of tests. And this is so true. When you first become Muslim, a lot of times, many of us, uh, I was born and raised Muslim, many of us who reverted back to Islam, you come into Islam and you have, say you've been a Muslim, you come into Islam, say at 25. Some people become Muslim at 30. Some people become Muslim at 40. Well, for 40 years, for 25 years, for 15 years, you have been indoctrinated with a certain type of mentality that doesn't go away when you become a Muslim. <laughs> so this is something that when we all know in terms of what I'm talking about, there's a lot of people who bring a lot of emotional baggage into Islam when they become Muslim. They have these certain types of things that they uh, were used to doing, and it may not necessarily stop once they become Muslim. Now you have some people, absolutely, they become Muslim and then they go on ahead and they own oh, everything. You have some people, they become Muslim and they still are dibbling and dabbling in haram, right? And so therefore they have somewhat of a disease in their heart and then we know through obedience to Allah and staying away from those things that inshallah that you become closer to Allah and then these bad habits that a person has, Eventually, inshallah, they'll go ahead and stop. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging, challenging battle Assad by saying, listen, there's no way in the world you haven't even been tested. The Muslims came in and was fighting the battle of Badr, the battle of Uhud, the battle of the trench. They were fighting, they were uh, uh, had to go through Tria Hudaybiyah. They had to, um, some of the Sahabas, their friends got killed. Uh, they got injured. There's no way in the world that you coming into Islam and you got the same amount of belief and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the earlier Muslims had, or the Muslims had, who actually went through a battery of tests. So Allah says in the Quran, remember, do men imagine that they will be left alone at ease because they say that we believe and not be tested with affliction? And so the Sahaba, Ibn uh, Anas Ibn Malik, reported that the Prophet wasallam, he said that the devil moves in a man like his blood. Man's belief is consistently being tried and tested. It is only by consistently overcoming the various obstacles of belief what Iman actually grows. SubhanAllah. I mean, if you think about this, sometimes Ibn Taymiyyah makes a, a, he says a, a statement and it's so true. He said that it's better for a calamity to hit you that take, I mean, no, I'm sorry, it's better for, yes, SubhanAllah, it's better for a calamity that hits you it reminds you and brings you closer to Allah, then Allah giving you a whole bunch of good things that's happening and it takes you away from Allah. So how many times do we, we going through stuff, stuff is going good, we got money, we just got a new car, we just got a new house, we can get clothes, we can get this, we can eat what we want, but we got a long line of good things happening to us. How often, how intense for some of us do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or when we get bad news of something, we get something in terms of dealing with our health, something in terms of dealing with our children. How often then, how fervent are you in really sitting down and begging and crying and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're going through that type of stuff? So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you. And like I said before, it's not to punish you, but it's to, it's to break you out almost to say deep waters where you think you're going to drown. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really purifying us in, in certain occasions. And so true belief is produced in affliction of human social relationships. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said that the believer who mixes with people and endures the harm they cause him is better than a believer who neither mixes with them nor endures their harm. So alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the true belief uh, or the true believer is the one we don't stay in the house all day, right? You know, that's why in certain environments, and I'm not going to say what kind of environment, you have person is in a particular environment and he or she is super Muslim in there. And then when they get out and they, when they get out and they get into a certain in any environment, a lot of times they become and they, they either leave Islam or they starting to uh, go inside of the, of, the, of the dunya or the sub dealing with jahiliyyah. And because of the fact that they were in an environment where Islam really wasn't tested. So when we go to work and we're dealing with the kuffar because we don't live in a Muslim society, but we live, we're dealing with non-Muslims who uh, who are, and, and subhanAllah, it didn't even necessarily got to be non-Muslims. It's Muslims that test you too. So when you're dealing, if you're in a situation where you're always constantly stuck in the house, then it's easy for you to be objective and it's easy for you to be judgmental about somebody's stuff when you're not mixing with the ignorance of people where your iman is not really being tested. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that a believer who mixes with people and endures the harm they cause him is better than a believer who neither mixes with them nor endures their harm, right? So it's both believers, but the one who endures the injuries and the harm of the people in terms of whatever sickness that they're dealing with on a, on a so social level, psychological level, then that believer is better than the one who doesn't do that, okay? So on entering Islam for the first time, and like I said before, Islam, a new convert, um, is exposed to the moral code of Islam, the rules um, of things that was they might have previously accepted. Because a lot of people, um, they were a lot, a lot of people who converted to Islam were Christians, and so one of the things that in Christianity uh, um, that shares with Islam, right, 
We believe in paradise. We believe in hellfire. We believe in fasting. We believe uh, in, in giving charity. We believe in being respectful to our parents. We believe in, um, uh, you know, doing things for the poor and, and all of those kind of things, right? So in terms of the same moral conduct, we believe in that. And that's one of the reasons why when Islam was being propagated in certain parts of North Africa, when the, when the Muslims started going, that the Dawah was accepted because the Christians could relate to a lot of the things that the Muslims were saying. Now, of course, we know that there's the, the big difference, and we don't believe that Isa alayhi salam is God or the son of God and, and so on and so forth, and he died for our sins and that kind of thing. So those are the things when a person, they accept Islam coming from a, a situation of a same moral conduct. So it's easier for them to understand that, but then there might be some things that they might be struggling with coming from that uh, other understanding as well, right? So, um, so some of the new principles, uh, it, it, it could be uh, pleasing to them, and then some of the other stuff might be an issue. So, say for instance, you have um, you have people that like to go to you know go to clubs. They like watching certain types of X-rated movies and that kind of thing. This is a reality, right? And um, and even the way that they interact as far as with uh, the opposite sex, right? So these are kind of new um, codes of conduct that the Muslims, uh, when you become a Muslim, that you have to learn that maybe would be more of a challenge for you because you've been doing something for 30, 40 years. For 25 years, a lot of a lot of people became Muslim in the early 20s. 20 years, that's a long time of you doing something and thinking something was okay, and then you're coming into a new situation. It's like, well, no, you got to change up. And so therefore, by increasing and doing the things in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to do, then inshallah, things become a lot easier for you to get away from the things that displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that the action dearest to Allah the Most High is love for Allah's sake, hatred for Allah's sake. The believer finally takes the sweetness of a man about which the Prophet Wasallam said, there are three qualities for which anyone who is characterized by them will experience the sweetness of faith. He to whom Allah and his messenger are dearer than any and all else, he who loves a human being for Allah's sake alone, and he who, is he who despises returning to disbelief after Allah has rescued him from it as he despises being cast into the fire. Alhamdulillah. And we, you know what? Now, for those of us who converted to Islam, you know, you have to get that feeling. You look at the people and the same thing for those of us who are born and raised Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, look at those nations that went before you. You know, you sometimes you look at the people and be like, oh, Oh, alhamdulillah, I'm Muslim. <laughs> okay, I ain't never trying to go back to that again. You know, alhamdulillah, I'm Muslim. I, you know, I, I can't imagine doing that. I mean, the thought of that would just drive me crazy. This is what the hadith, you despise. I would never want to go back to worshiping an idol or believing that somebody died for my sins and I just wasn't held accountable for nothing. And I was unhappy because I didn't have any guidance. Alhamdulillah for Islam. So this is like the sweetness of Iman. So the reality is that faith evolves and it grows gradually and reckon and uh, must be recognized and accepted in order to uh, that of a new person who converts to Islam, whether you had a Muslim parent or a non-Muslim parent. Okay, such individual may take extreme positions dangerous to both himself and the Ummah based on his misconception of himself. And his relationship to true iman. And subhanAllah, this is so true. This is a big fitness that's, that's in, in, in Islam. You know, you have groups that are very extreme. And this is, you know, extremism is haram in Islam. Extremism in, in, in nitpicking and religious um, matters. These are things that we stay away from in, in Islam, right? So um, a person can have all of the, the good um, intentions. As far as on the extreme level of being of, of Islam, right? But they can cause a lot of damage, and it's and it's happened before. People have been extreme and caused have ruined and destroyed Islamic communities. 
with a with an extreme mind thought. And this comes from not having the proper a lot of time education about the deeds, right? And so therefore it becomes when we having these types of talks, uh Shek Ibrahim, Sister Layla, um, Brother Issa, when they're having these types of conversations in order for us to take away. Because there's a lot of times when people have thought something was haram and it actually wasn't. And because of the fact, one of my favorite, favorite scholars is Yusuf Qadadawi. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. Yusuf Qadadawi, he made a statement and he said that when he was getting to show you how uh, important education is, right? There's an ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about when a woman is a uh, is on her immenses as far as her husband not sleeping with her, right? So people were actually taking this literally. Also, there's another thing where um, uh, there was a big fitna and causing problems in a marriage where they thought that it was haram to kiss your wife while you're fasting, right? And so therefore, because of the fact of a person who is... Um, uh, they were taking this information and not properly understanding the hadith. Because remember, we talked about tafsir of Quran by language, right? And then there's tafsir of Quran by hadith. And so because of the fact that people took literally, oh, you know what? My wife is in hate. She's on her menses. It's haram. It's not permissible for me to even sleep in the bed with her, right? And so what Sheikh um, pointed out is that even the Prophet Sallallahu was Wasallam in a narration by Aisha right out to Anha, that when she was, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was praying to Haju, and she in front of, she was like in front of him, and she was on her menses. So imagine the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi making to Haju in front of, with his wife being in front of him, and she said she moved her leg. <laughs> so you need that kind of information. So that got that out the way. And then the understanding about kissing your wife, kissing your husband, as long as it doesn't arouse a desire where it's going to mess up your fasting, it's okay. So it's important to have these types of understandings and these types of uh, uh, this knowledge and the total understanding about hadiths, right? Because we live in a place where we need all of the leverage that we possibly can. The prophet so, and be and still be within the confines of Islam. Because what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do, he would show you the very least you could do through his example, he could show you the very most you could do through his example, right? When I always think about that, I think about Salat al-Fajr. So at one time, the, the, Sahab, the Sahaba said that we prayed Fajr so early that it was so dark that you could barely tell who was next to you. And then we prayed Salat al-Fajr and it was so light that we could see easily who was standing next to us almost to the point where we thought that it went out. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through his example shows you the most you could do and the least that you could do, right? And so therefore, having these types of discussions, being able to alhamdulillah for the, the scholars that have found this information, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them the finest kind of information in order to make our life easier and we can still be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, and so therefore, that is the conclusion of the um, of the 16th verse of Surah Al Hujurat, and then it says, "Of course, Allah knows all well. No, Allah knows well all things, right? So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, a person accept Islam and they and they job about it. Allah knows all of that stuff, you know. So you come, people have to." What is it say? Whoever migrated for a messenger, or whoever migrated for Allah and his messenger, that's what they got. Whoever migrated for a woman, that's what he got. You know what I mean? You know, we don't escape anything. Allah knows everything, right? So, getting into the 17th verse, Allah says, they consider their acceptance of Islam a favor to you. Say, do you not make your Islam a favor to, uh, do not make your Islam a favor to me, Instead, it is Allah who has done you a favor by guiding you to Iman, and if you are earnest. Ibn Abbas, may Allah, uh, 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 may Allah be pleased with him, reported that when Banu Asad came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, we accepted Islam, all the Arabs fought you and we did not. 
the Prophet Sallallahu said, aside, verily, they have little understanding and shaitan controls their tongues. Then Allah revealed this verse. They consider their Islam as a favor to you and if you are earnest was revealed. They expressed to the Prophet Sallallahu that they had done him great favors, firstly, by not fighting him and his followers as the other Arab tribes had done, and secondly, by accepting Islam, which he was propagating. Right? So their intentions for mentioning that is they said, listen, we did all of that. We deserve something extra and special from you. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to clear their up the ignorance by first telling them not to think that their Islam is a favor to him. And secondly, by informing them that the favor was in fact done for them and not by them. Because it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who held back the rain and gave them a drought. Because if it wasn't for that, then they would have been, you know, messed up and probably would have been kufar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his infinite wisdom and mercy, he gave them the drought, which pushed them to Medina in order for them to accept and to choose, uh, accept Islam. Right? So some of them out of conviction and some of them out of convenience did that. So Allah says in the Quran, that you are not responsible for their guidance, but it is Allah who guides whom he pleases, right? Then Allah has explicitly said that he not only will guide some categories of people, those who have consciously and deliberately chosen evil over good, and Allah says, Allah does not guide an unjust people, God means, and Allah does not guide a disbelieving people, and Allah does not guide a rebellious people, Farsi king, and Allah does not guide one who is a lying and obstinate disbeliever, a kadab kafar. Uh, verily, Allah does not guide one who is wasteful and is a habitual liar. So these are different verses from the Quran of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't guide these people. Even though these people, of course, they have a choice, you understand, to become Muslim. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran as to these types of categories of people. Right, so we should number one stay away from being a liar, a person who consistently tells lies. We shouldn't lie, period. All right, but you know, a person who consistently lies, a disbelieving kafir, you who is evil, and so on and so forth. Okay, so Allah will provide ample opportunities for them to escape these paths of misguidance and find the true path of Islam. Right, so there's another thing, too. Um, People often ask, ask ask this question: What if a person didn't hear about ever hear about Islam and they go in there? The short answer is no. You have, say, for instance, uh, many of us seen uh, like documentaries of those Indians in the Amazon jungle <laughs> that never, you know, hardly even they got groups of people. I think that they still find into this day that had never necessarily had anything to do with the outside world and that kind of thing, right? So you have people that's in, uh, the, in it, the Sheikh uses like an African animist in the midst of the rainforest uh, who never heard about the message of Islam. Um, you have or, or a Japanese somewhere up in the mountains that never heard about Islam. You know, if they come to the realization that worshiping idols is haram, like, you know, like Prophet Ibrahim al Islam. You know, he looked at, he said, what did he say? That he was going to worship the sun. And then when the sun declined, he said he was going to worship the moon. And when the moon declined, he said he had enough smarts to say, well, you know what? I'm going to worship the creator of the sun and the moon, right? So he had sense. So if a person comes with an understanding about the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, who is not, and as far as not worshiping, you know, idols and, you know, that kind of thing, they try to do good deeds, you know, based upon the knowledge that's available to them, then that's a different situation. You know, if such people, uh, the, the Sheikh said, if such people happen to come in contact with formal Islam and they immediately accept it as, uh, as totally consistent what they already believe. But if they do not accept Islam out of personal pride or cultural prejudices, as usually the case of those who reject Islam, knowing it to be true, they have gone astray and betrayed themselves. I mean, I like that. Betrayed themselves, and they are, uh, and their just reward is nothing but other than the hellfire. Islam is Allah's favor to man, 
in order that he may be guided to true Iman if he is earnest and honest about his commitments. Okay? Allah expects no favor in return for his favor as there is nothing man, uh, a man can favor Allah with. A man is ob uh, obliged to thank Allah for his favors and sincerely try to be worthy of them. And alhamdulillah. So that's the end of, um, inshallah, next time I'll go over the 18th verse and then that'll be the last um, class on Surah to Hujra. But this is so true. A lot of us sometimes, you see people, they come into Islam with conditions. When Allah says, enter into Islam wholeheartedly, when we have bad habits and it's something that's displeasing to Allah, we don't have the mentality of all that. We have the intention. We have to have the mentality that Allah, please help me and stop doing things in which displeases you. Right? Because we know, number one, anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden is to our benefit. Anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enjoined is to our benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and he, cre he created us and, um, and knows what's best for us. Okay? So therefore, um, we have to always be constantly thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how do we thank Allah? By doing those things in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoined upon us to do, and then we do the extra things as well, right? And so in the Hadith Qudsi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when a person starts doing extra things, then he becomes the eyes in which they see, the ears in which they hear, the hand in which they hold things, which means that Allah has intervened in a person's heart that you don't like looking at the things Allah don't want you to look at. You don't like listening to the things that Allah don't like you listening to. You don't like of walking in a direction of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like, right? So therefore, it becomes a situation or whatever where these kinds of uh, things become easy for us because our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so, it, it, it's getting there, it's getting stronger. And so, um, so that's, so inshallah, we'll stop from there. I apologize for um, uh, coming on late, uh, a little bit later, whatever, but um, Inshallah, if anybody has any questions or comments or anything like that, uh, Bismillah. Okay, Alhamdulillah. I guess they don't have any questions. Okay. Jazakallah khair, brother. Beautiful life. Barakallah khair. Barakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. Um, once again, if anybody got anything from this, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I, uh, in anything bad, um, that I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any mistakes, that I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to forgive me and, and have mercy upon me. I mean, subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu anna ilaha ilaha anta wa astakfirukum wa atubu ulayhi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi.